So I think what's happening is that realistically, not just, you know, so we're in a contemporary context in which all of this is happening. And I think it was not dissimilar from the kind of political and social context in which the road decision was reached in the first instance. So I think why you have these kind of maximalist, maximalist arguments that don't really allow any quarter for a moral ambiguity is because there's this anxiety about the fact that we are losing and that substantive rights are being stripped away and that Republicans are rallying to have a national abortion ban, not just this kind of state by state approach that they claim is their only goal. And that people are concerned, rightly or wrongly, I'm just trying to put words to, I think, the psychological phenomenon that's driving the catapults of the world. There is a feeling that if you allow for any of the moral ambiguity that I think many people have or experience, not everyone, obviously some people, people are different, but that is, I think, broadly understood, then you are giving credit to conservative arguments that were, are going to lead absolutely to a ban on abortion. And that, I think, is where a lot of nuance dies, is people being so afraid and needing to defend their position in a maximalist way because they're so concerned about what happens if you allow the camel's nose under the proverbial tent. Now, in my personal experience, I have found that acknowledging ambiguity makes you as an interlocutor seem a lot more trustworthy and a lot more human and is on a case-by-case, person-by-person perspective much more persuasive. So I remember at one point during the Bernie campaign, we were canvassing and went into a beauty salon and the young woman I was with, no shade to her, she's a lovely person, but was younger and I think had a more activist perspective on the issue. Kind of like burst into the barbershop and immediately was like confronting these women, uh, the beauty salon rather, and confronted these women saying, hey, you know, do you care about abortion? Bernie's pro-abortion, you should have the right to have an abortion, 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 abortion. And the women, the predominantly, you know, black women in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, exclusively black women, but in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, I could see how uncomfortable they were. They were uncomfortable. This is my read of the situation. I can't say what's in their mind specifically. But it seemed to me that they were uncomfortable at the presumption that they specifically might care about abortion as a priority and the stereotyping of black women as loose, um, and, you know, the primary folks that get abortions um, and stereotypes about the vir- black men and virility and all those other kinds of things that made them uncomfortable. Uncomfortable at the idea of talking about something as a community that is disproportionately religious, that has religious implications for them and their families. And my friend and co-canvasser presumed that because we're left and we're black and Democrat and black people are Democrats, that this was going to be not a sensitive issue. And I see that all the time. And I completely agree with you that I think that writers like Katha, a lot of more elite feminists take an approach that is not always so useful to the movement. At the same time, I completely understand why it is that people are reluctant to open the door to conversations about moral ambiguity because we just had a Supreme Court that I would argue did not make a sufficient case in the decision, did not make the case themselves for why it is that they are overturning Rome outside of what you might project onto them, which is a religious motivation. And at core of that, I think, is this question that you presented, which is whether or not you have to have a determination about when life begins to be to have a, a, a position on abortion. Because like I said, my, issue, my, my raising the issue of the death penalty was not to endorse the death penalty. Obviously, I also don't endorse the death penalty. But to point to the fact that many people across the ideological spectrum do think that there are cases in which killing is appropriate. Self-defense is another example that I think is less fraught right. than the death penalty. I, I, I agree with that. But we recognize, I, I said that in the book. I said that a severe social stigma, a severe social stigma, but the woman has the last say, is the equivalent of the commandment, thou shalt not kill. However, there's the caveat of the right to self-defense. But you have to have that broad moral stigma before you acknowledge the exception, the caveat, be it self-defense 
or the right to abortion. So I don't have a problem with that. I do have to say, and I'm very happy to engage you, I do have to say, I cannot agree. And I think every class I taught it, the consensus of the class was, there was no credible argument in Roe defending a constitutional right to abortion. The claim that Dobbs, the, the most recent decision, that Judge Justice Alito, with the six justices in general, the, fact, the claim that they did not make a credible case, in my opinion, is untenable. Now, I read Dobbs many times, even though it's just recently um, came down, I studied it closely. I, I read the, the Alito opinion when it was leaked around three times, and I read Dobbs at least three times. I want to make sure I get the argument right because I'm not, I'm, a, uh, um, I'm not an expert in these things, but I don't want to leave the book open to uh, people saying, what is he talking about? He has no idea what the law is, no. Okay. Alito was correct that basically in Supreme Court jurisprudence, there are three ways to detect the right. And he put it in a simple formula. There's text, does it say it in the constitution? You have this right. There's history. Well, there are some unenumerated rights that we all possess. Uh, we know it from our long history and tradition but they're not written into the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't say anything about marriage, but clearly you have a right to marry. It's not there in the Constitution. So the technical term that they use is unenumerated rights. How do you know an unenumerated right? Well, you're supposed to look for it in our history and tradition. That's the part that's, okay. that's the part that's I'm going to get wrong, to arguably. Not okay. the fact of the unenumerated rights. Obviously, people who want there to be privacy rights believe there should be, un that's an unenumerated right. But the question of whether or not we find those unenumerated rights in, a, in the history from 1630 or wherever he was okay. digging these things up from, that's what people are pushing back okay. against, I'm, especially I'm, since there's not a commensurate issue with the unenumerated rights with respect to other um, so-called rights, like the enormous overreach, one might argue, of gun rights. I, when I no the founding fathers that. didn't have any understanding of contemporary weapons, and, and in fact, the bullet had not even been invented, yet now we have all of these legal opinions saying you can carry an AR-15 AR in a school zone and all these other kinds of silly I have things. No, I have no problem with what you're just saying, but I do have a problem with what you said preceding that. But let me just get to the third criteria sure. that Alito and then the court uh, 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 enumerated. And the red is just going to confuse your listeners. The third possibility, and they call that precedent. Mm -hmm. So let's look at what some Supreme Court precedents are. And on the basis of those precedents, maybe there is a right to abortion. Okay? So, enumerated right, text, that's out. Obviously, there's nothing in the Constitution saying a woman has a right to an abortion. Let's go to the next possibility history and tradition. Roe attempted to show, now I'm referring, I don't want to confuse your listeners, the original abortion decision by Justice Blackman, he attempted to show that our history, meaning American history and tradition, is ambiguous on the question of a woman's right to abortion. And he cited some uh, several sources. Alito, in the course of about 30 pages, destroyed that claim. There can be no question that from common law up until the beginning of the 1800s, abortion was illegal at the point of quickening, where you can feel the fetus embryo, whatever you want to call it, moving in your body. And before that, it's a little bit grayer. But beginning in the 1800s, then laws started to be passed that said all abortion is illegal. By the time of the 14th Amendment, the uh, Liberty Clause in the 14th Amendment, 
It's about three quarters of the states in our union have declared all abortion illegal. And that was pretty much the case up until Roe. Beginning with around a few years before Roe, there was a liberalization of abortion in several states. But basically, that's the picture. And nobody has questioned or doubted Alito's historical account in the Dobbs opinion. I, 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 I have to push back against that. Many, many people have norm. If, now, if you, you read, might not agree read, with their takes, but if, many people have focused on the cherry picking of historical examples that Alito undertook. No, if you read the dissent, and I'm sure you did, the Sotomayor, Breyer, um, uh, Kagan dissent, they had just a couple of lines, a couple of lines, which they desperately clung to in order to uh, throw doubt on Alito's history. It was not a compelling counter. Wait, so your, your argument is that the dissent didn't sufficiently or didn't engage with the, no, Alito's well, well, history the, significantly, but that's not no one. And what no, I'm saying no, is I, I might not listen to I, I read, the three legalistas uh, on the crooked media, but all, all of the lefty Supreme Court podcast that I listened to. I listened to all or, of them. Did did it did it a no, lot or, of interrogation of the cherry picking of the historical? I, record. I don't think that's correct. I'm not going to argue with you. you know, listeners can, you know, go, if they're curious, they can uh, go and check it out themselves. I don't think it's correct. I think that the history, at least, I'm not an expert in the history, but I didn't see any beginning with the dissent. I didn't see any serious engagement with the history. But that, but in part, that's, wait, wait. that's, that's, a, that, but, but Norm, that's partly because people disagree with the idea of the, he, he created a requirement. Their issue was that Alio created a requirement that you be able to find, no, at the point of unenumerated rights, the Ninth Amendment doesn't say, if you can find enough historical evidence that this people had a law about this in the past, you're allowed to have a law, this as, protected as a right today. That was a fiction, a legal fiction created by Alito. So to the extent that some people on the left have chosen not to go tit for tat uh, through some kind of historiography, it's because they don't believe in the conceit that it requires that kind of historical precedence to find a legal right. You started this by saying, of course, we have a right to marriage. Of course, we have a right to marriage. We don't, of course, have a right to gay marriage. That's not something that exists. I'm not going to tell you. You've said several things here, which I do not believe, not that I'm in any way uh, impugning your integrity. I just don't think that they're factually accurate. But you're correct. That's what's been said. Now, you but I'm sorry, to, so what, what is the argument then that I'm the gonna, Constitution requires you to find that, gonna, to I'm find going, an unenumerated I'm, right, it I'm has going, to have? I'm going, I'm going to get to that. But That's if I could say, so one last thing to wrap that point up, Norm, the implications of that as a standard are that mm -hmm. we can never have anything, there can be no rights protected that were not protected in the past, okay, okay. which on no, its no, face no, makes no sense if we want a progressive country. That's a completely incorrect inference, and I'll get to that presently. First of all, everybody is on the woke left is claiming, is alleging that Alito invented this standard of history and tradition. Now, you went to a very good law school, Brianna. You must know that the standard of looking for a right based on history and tradition, long, 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 long no. predates. No, Norm. Legal. What, what I learned are, most conclusively are, in law no, school is that are, people make up dozens, justifications dozens. for the outcomes that they want. That's the only inconsistency that you I'm, find not, not, in the law. That's not what I'm asking, or that's not what I'm saying. Bri uh, Brianna. I demand of you honesty and candor and not trying to score polemical points. You must know that the standard of history and tradition in order 
to define an unenumerated right long, long, long predates Justice Sam Alito. You will find in every single Supreme Court decision pertaining to this, they always cite a half dozen or a dozen uh, precedents in the court saying that we should look at history and tradition. That's not my argument, Nora. Okay, wait. Now, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm just trying to establish the baseline. So, but my, my point is that it's correct. irrelevant. Look, it doesn't right, matter because it's I'm always going, been pretextual. That's, yeah, that's what I'm going to get to. That's what I'm going to get to. First, I want the facts to be established, and then we can discuss how to interpret the facts. History and tradition was not invented by Sam Alito, period, full stop. Now, the question is, if you don't like history and tradition, what do you want? So do you want nine unelected justices who represent in terms of income, in terms of education, in terms of geography, who represent about one thousandth part of one percent of the American people, do you want the most undemocratic body in our branches of government? Do you want them, as they like to say, to use their quote, reasoned judgment in deciding what are our rights as Americans, as American Norm, citizens? They're, they're already doing that and have but, done that since Marbury, like, Marbury v. Madison. You see, you see, I don't know. I don't like the idea. No, Marbury versus Madison says the Supreme Court is the last word based on the Constitution. No, they made it up. They no, made it up. No, That's the whole point. No, you did no, the judicial, the power of judicial I, review, Norm. I, I, this isn't a matter they, of agreeing know, or not agreeing. They, I know they made up judicial review. I know that. But my point is, do you want to expand and expand and expand and expand the purview of the Supreme Court Nine justices. No, the answer eight, is no, Norm. Eight, and I eight want... of the nine went to Harvard or Yale Law School. No, they but the answer to that is not to... Number. They represent absolutely nobody. And you want them to be making these decisions? I say we shouldn't turn the Supreme Court, a completely unelected and unrepresentative body, into a super legislature. I right, and my response problem. to that... Right. And my response to that, as we have talked about extensively on this podcast, is to get rid of judicial review, not to pretend that there has ever been anything but a fiction that the Supreme Court, since its inception, has been not always nine, but some number of unelected elites that d decide whatever they want to do I completely agree. outside of the democratic I process. Agree. That has always been the case. It, sometimes occasionally we've had Nico Bowie, a Harvard professor on here speaking at length, along with Eric Siegel, who's a professor uh, from Georgia, talking extensively about how, although there are a couple of examples in the history of the of the United States of America where that. the Supreme Court has militated in favor of progressive rights, I overwhelmingly it has sided with the elites, the economic elites, the racial uh, majority, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the point that people are arguing about Alito's opinion is not that he reinvented the wheel, but that he does what conservatives always do, which is to take these concepts like originalism, textualism, and now history and try. And all of these are ideologies that cast back into the past to establish what our contemporary rights are. They are by design regressive. So the nature, the, the notion that I'm going to buy into a historical analysis point blank period as a prescription for what we should be deciding for the future of the United States of America, the idea that you should be relying on the Constitution at all, when even its founders thought there should be a constitutional convention and a revolution of sorts every 19 or so years is at, at, on face value atavistic and not a conceit that most people on the left are willing to buy into on the I'm first in the first place. You're, you're missing... 
I'm, I'm not saying that you personally are buying into it, but I'm trying I'm to explain. Saying, I'm saying there are two separate issues, Brianna. One is, is there a constitutional right to abortion? Two is, wait, two is, what should our society's standard be for abortion? Those are completely separate issues. You could say there's no constitutional right to abortion. Indeed, that the idea there is a constitutional right is completely absurd. But you can then go on to say, I think our legislature or our Congress should pass a law that says X, Y, and Z. But so Norm, when you stated first three ways that you can get to a yes. constitutional right, the third one was literally precedent. That's and so correct. to sit here and say, you can decide, that you can feel like Roe was wrongly decided. Mm -hmm. But in the course of all of these people's confirmation hearings, and over the course of the last 50 years, Roe has been the law, or more accurately, Casey has been the law of the land. Okay? And so the, the whole point of it is every aspect of this is a legal fiction. It's precedent until Republicans decide it's not precedent. It's a, it's a, it's 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 not founded in you know it has to be founded in history until it's a gun right which is completely this made up mumbo jumbo as though any of these assault rifles and other kinds of high powered ammunition that didn't exist back then were at all in the founders conception and deeply rooted history it's all a shell game and the point that it's all a shell game means that I'm not going to sit here and say there is no right there is no constitutional right to abortion when there is equally a constitutional right to abortion as there is to me Op doing open carry in New York or whatever that case was that the Supreme Court also put down that week, right? So to, to, to sit here, I understand what you're saying as an intellectual exercise, it's but the point of the matter is, it's not an intellectual the, the point of the matter is to say that abortion, the right to abortion is a legal fiction without pointing to the extent to which all of it, Citizens United, all of it is a legal fiction. No, uh, is is, uh, is to uh, many people conceding unnecessary ground. I do believe that we have a right whether or not it's constitutional or otherwise, to choose. Now, but the ethical ambiguities said, and just like said, what you, just like you, you say said. in your in your book chapter, you're talking about Bernie Sanders asserting health care as a human right. Right. You know, if, if the weakness comes at the fact that you're trying to ascribe that right to a written document from 200 odd years ago that obviously doesn't have it in it, that's fine. But we have to be even handed about those rights which really don't exist. And what we do know that is in the Constitution is the Ninth Amendment says there is a broad latitude of unenumerated rights that exist. And the Ninth Amendment says nothing about you have to have found it in, you know, Chaucer for it to have been real, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that is the part that I'm objecting to. Not We all understand that literally there's no right to lots of things in the Constitution. Uh, Brianna. Yes. Um, here's my, so as it were, problem. If you want to say to me, I don't give a darn what the Supreme Court says. I don't, or the Constitution and for that I, matter. I, I just think it's uh, just one more uh, body designed to oppress and exploit people. Okay, that's fine. I find that probably I have a large amount of sympathy with that. Personally, I come from a radical left, and I retain my radical beliefs of my youth. I've not changed. However, it's a very different thing to say that and to claim regard and deference for the institution and to claim that everything Alito said or the justices said in Dobbs is nonsense. No, well, Norm, it'll I, be a cold day in hell before you catch me having uh, deference and regard I, for, yeah, <laughs> for the Supreme I, I'm, Court. I'm reading, <laughs> I'm reading the commentary, and the commentary was not attacking the Supreme Court as an institution. Well, that's because you're listening to the Crooked Media podcast, no, no, Professor. No, 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 no. The, 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 the commentary was attacking these justices for violating and breaching the Constitution, which is something very different. Well, look, I think, so, it's, I think it's completely legitimate to acknowledge the specific ideological project of these justices. That is far outside of the, even the norms of a broken institution that I personally don't respect. At the same time, 
that you don't respect that institution and want either court reform, the end of judicial review, court packing, any number of these proposals that have been put forward by the left. I think you can say it's an illegitimate institution, but also it's being exploited in a particularly pernicious way right now by these justices that have been put here by the Federalist Society, which is this dark money backed group mm-hmm. that's existed since the 1980s and Leo, what's his face and all of that mm-hmm. stuff. Like you can, I think you can hold both of those things in your mind at the same time. Right, but I will but, agree with you that separate, many of the liberals. They're separate issues. But you mo- can hold both of them, but they're separate issues. Right. When I teach Supreme Court law, I don't come into class the first day and say, this is all bullshit. The Supreme Court is a just another apparatus of the ruling class to repress and exploit the, the toiling masses. Why not? Why not, Norm? I don't. Well, first of all, because it's not intellectually very interesting. And really? Second, no, it's not. It, I, it, it, I, it, I don't it, know that I agree with that. I don't well, know that I agree I with that. I find it much more interesting uh, as a professor. I find it much more interesting to read the cases and to see whether they logically hold or not. Whether, well, <laughs> whether the cases are really about politics or whether they're about war. Spoiler they're... alert, they don't. Like that, don't. that is the project of law school. And, and I think all and too I infrequently, do. I think all too infrequently, most people's legal education, even though students experience the dissonance of how inconsistent these holdings are, right. most law schools never are ex- um, explicit about how political the, port, the court as a body is. And that's how you get all of these you know, big brained legal scholars on these podcasts wringing their hands and saying, oh, my God, I can't believe the court has become such a political institution. And my, I think, most intellectually stimulating law class was from a person, my uh, a corporate law professor who was a Marxist and law and economics professor who told us very, you know, he let us he didn't like dump it on our heads in like this explicit terms on on the first day. But from day one started leading us down the path of, Look at how biased these systems are. Who are these systems intended to protect? And we'll put the question to the the class. Who do you think should be the most vulnerable constituency when you're designing corporate law? Should it, in fact, be the shareholders? Because that's the way it's designed. Can you think of some other constituencies we might design our policies to protect? You know, and to me, that was revelatory because it was the first time in probably two years of law school at that point that anyone had really explicitly called out these systems for being so... You know, when I learned Buck v. Bell... um. I actually think I learned it from that same professor who I had it for torts. Uh, and I think that most, he, he explained to us how many of the tort, tort cases that we're typically taught are taught. We had to read a bunch of background cases on eugenics. We in that class had to read, and um, there's another case that's in the same kind of like Oliver Wendell Holmes cohort of cases about a, an Irish immigrant who comes to the America, is forced to get a vaccine to come off Ellis Island, has a bad reaction and it's whether or not She can sue whether or not the doctors are liable for her damages. And the case, the court said, no, of course, if you want the right to come to America, you got to pony up and submit. And then he talks a lot about power and she couldn't really speak English or read the signs. And they said that she accepted the risk, but she had no idea it was being injected into her arm. And, but, you know, those kind of discussions were so much more illuminating for me and evolved me so much politically more than reading a bunch of nonsensical cases back to back to back to back when it was clear that the only reason why this establishment law came out this way is because the court didn't respect Santa Teria and murdering a chicken in your backyard. Whereas in this case, they really did respect Catholicism or one of the big three religions and had much more deference for people's practice of it. You know? Um, I agree uh, well, it depends. You know, you can take a, a textual analysis of the Supreme Court decisions, analyze the logic, analyze the reasoning, seeing, where, seeing whether it holds up or not. Or you can take a kind of sociological approach and say, well, if you situate this case within the sociology of the rights of this group or the lack of rights of that group, then you see this, then the other. I prefer the first case. But it's all sociological, Norm. No, that, well, that, no. That's part of what we're getting at. That it's a pretext. What some You said it yourself. Some rich elite justice is sitting up there coming up with just reasons and vibes for why he thinks yeah, but, that but, Buck's family or Bell's family, I forget but, which is which, but, but, should be murdered. I should have their I, tubes tied. Yeah. Because they are unfit. And by the way, in that case, they weren't actually by any clinical designation. I know. Well, unfit. Out, there was no evidence. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, I don't want to I don't want to go now into pedagogical approaches, but I'm kind of I'm going to just say my own 
impulse after having spent my entire adult life and even less than my adult life as a teacher, uh, to use your phrase from a moment ago, I don't like to lead students down any road. I feel very uncomfortable about that. I like to put the decision, the opinion up on a, you know, the screen and let's just go through it paragraph by paragraph. And you decide, is there a compelling argument here? Is it a uh, convincing argument? Because most of the cases deal with real, that we examine in class, the class I do is uh, race, sex, and privacy. The main Supreme Court decisions are race, sex, and privacy. Mm -hmm. And they deal with real life issues. Uh, I happen to think Plessy is a much more impressive legal opinion than Brown. Brown is absolutely horrible. Uh, Plessy is quite interesting because they make a distinction between political rights, social rights, uh, political rights, economic rights, and social rights. Uh, it's a more interesting decision, but we go through it. Uh, uh, it's political rights. I can't remember the middle category and social rights, but it'll come back to me. Um, so we go through it. I don't like, I don't like the omniscient uh, professor either by uh, by intent, either by design, or by overt proselytizing. To lead students anywhere. I don't feel comfortable with that. I, I don't feel comfortable with that either, but I also think it's, and I'm not saying you're saying this, but I also think it's that naive to think that the status quo of how law is taught is neutral. It is, in oh, fact, I, people being led aggressively right, down well, a different only, political path. Yeah, but I'm talking about me. I don't know how other people teach. Uh, after a long history, of, uh, a long period in my life of thinking I had a monopoly on the truth, we thought it was Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought after a long period and then coming to the humble conclusion that I'm lucky if I get one out of every hundred things I say right. Hey YouTube, thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.